And action. Excellent. <laughs> Hello, ladies, and good evening. Welcome to the Austin chapter of Invest Her, all women investing in real estate. So tonight we have our speaker series. And um, I, am, I am your co-host. My name is Megan Flake. And this is our other co-host. Vivian Yips. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Vivian Yips. <laughs> Uh, we are um, we are proud to host, and we love doing this. We each have um, our own passion about why we are here and what we are doing with InvestHer. So um, thank you so much for coming and investing in your faces. So we actually have a lot of shared common background. Um, as you can tell, uh, we both come from corporate America. Uh, we both have backgrounds in supply chain and data analytics. Um, Lean Six Sigma and, and networking. So, um, kind of Lean Six Sigma really kind of falls out of corporate America really quick, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Megan, um, she's been in real estate since 2007. Her focus is not only just being a realtor, but she's also an investor specialist. So, if anyone's looking for information from an investing standpoint, she is your gal. Um, she's also more skilled than I am because she's got multiple asset classes under her belt. So you want to talk more about that? Yeah, I'm, I'm in three different states. I'm in uh, a few different asset classes, not just single family homes, but also um, commercial, uh, multifamily and triple net families. Um, so I've gone through a few different paths and have made tons of mistakes, but I've also learned from all those mistakes over the past 15 years of investing. Um, yeah, I'd say I love that because if anybody knows commercial, it's super, super male dominated. So to have female mm -hmm. representation, it's so it's it's just refreshing. That's so, right. lastly, don't forget this master nego mistress negotiator. <laughs> <laughs> right? She no, she comes from GE. She has a really strong background in procurement. Was it? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So I uh, I did the logistics negotiating for the wind turbines, which is hundred million dollar deals um, all over the world. Also doing um, parts purchasing and some labor. So uh, a little bit of everything. And GE ranked me very high in the first six months. In the top ten talent of the company, um, ten percent talent of the company. So uh, they thought I was really really good, mm -hmm. really really quick. So that was my strong suit. Our half million dollar house in Austin was not. <laughs> and Vivian here has been investing even, she's been in real estate even longer than I have. She's been in real estate since 2004. She does uh, a lot of different venues of real estate investing, short-term rentals, medium-term rentals, and she also flips, which is amazing. With my husband, so I'm not just comparing myself. <laughs> <laughs> which is amazing. So if you are looking for corporate housing, corporate rentals, medium-term rentals, Vivian's definitely your person. She's your point of contact. If you want to learn how to do this, she's a uh, mecca of knowledge, and she has so many resources to help and to guide and mentor and uh, provide those um, those skill sets and those tools. I just want to say, like, I think of myself as a really good problem solver, and having a good problem solving skill, and also having a really great network, it's really helped me blossom in this industry. Um, case in point, last week I helped a flipper prevent uh, going into default. So that was, you know, something that I feel really good about, she felt really good about, and, you know, it's just a win-win situation overall. So, um, awesome. if you ever have any questions or have a problem you want to solve, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Oh, one other thing is, I do have another business but that I'm not talking about tonight, but it is Cash for Austin Homes. So, that's... What it is, Cash for Austin. <laughs> so this is our mission for Invest Her. Uh, we have meetups, podcasts, the only one in the room. Um, uh, we want to live a financially free and balanced life, and we do that um, by empowering women in real estate because more money in the hands of women rises the entire world in all shifts. And if you didn't know, InvestHer is a global group, mm -hmm. right? We're just a small little part of the chapter. I think on Meetup, we have almost a thousand members and in Facebook, we have about 668 members. We are making a push to hit a thousand members by the end of the year. So awesome. Please, please invite your friends to Meetup because yeah. it's awesome. 
And our goal is to keep these events free, yeah. right? And that it's so helpful. We have great sponsors like Build a Supply, Supply Group. We had Amazing Realty before. Um, I'm sponsoring the food this time, but you know, next time it's always, it's going to be somebody else. If you know somebody that's, you know, I like to promote female run businesses. So if you know someone that's a female business owner, especially in a male dominated industry, I love having those people in to talk about their business and share with us, you know, something about them. Okay. Lastly, if you're not already following, check out the real estate investor on Instagram. Also the community, there's a greater community than just the Austin community, as well as the podcast. It's really good, super good content. And <clears throat> quick disclaimer, we are not attorneys, accountants, or financial advisors. All information shared during this investor meetup or as follows is ed for educational purposes only. Always conduct your own due investigation, analysis, due diligence, draw your own conclusions, and make your own decisions. Really quickly, you want to talk about the... So I got to go to InvestorCon this year for the 2022 conference. It was amazing. It was their flagship, the first one they ever had. It was really great. I have an accountability group that came out, out of it, and um, meeting up with them on a regular basis has just really helped me to what I need to do to make the next step. And that brainstorming in the small group is fantastic, but also being inspired at InvestorCon was amazing. It was... It was just so fantastic. So, 2023, it's going to be in Scottsdale, and it's in May, something or another. I bought a ticket already. I already bought my um, hotel room as well. Um, there is a special pricing right now, so you guys can still register for it. This is this is the this is the nationwide. This is the actually worldwide investor. Yeah. And the uh, social media on the previous slide was also for the worldwide. Investor, it was not the Austin chapter. Yeah, we don't do podcasts. <laughs> We're not that <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to create content. <laughs> so um, it's it's great. Um, uh, any questions that you have about it or what it was like? I really enjoyed that they had so many different breakouts. Um, Bigger Pockets does sponsor it, um, and I'm actually a preferred realtor for Bigger Pockets in Austin. So they don't award that slot to many people at all, but I am one of them. Um, and it's great because they do a lot of inner collaboration because you hear from like women they're doing breakout groups for almost everything you want to do so they do storage and um, house hacking and also getting into um, land leasing or syndication and you can go really deep into a subject matter and if you're like you came away with so many notes like how am I going to possibly debrief all of this because in an hour and a half I just took away everything um, so I really really love the conference if you can make it, I would strongly consider to put it into your 2023 goals. And what's the limited time offer? What is That's the next slide, right? Oh, yeah. okay, sorry. <laughs> I don't know how much longer it's good for. Um, so November yeah. 15th. There we go. Yeah. So from what I learned, I met with the other investor leaders uh, at the Bigger Pockets Conference, and we sat around and had lunch, and they told me about this beautiful place that they booked. So this is it. The entire place will be reserved for investor con. Oh. So it's going to be amazing. So I encourage you guys to go. You can you can hopefully I don't know back person. Can you guys like? Can you, can you get it? I think can you so. scan that at all? It's trying. It did. It, it, did it work? It popped up. It's just not. Oh, loading. Loading. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to make it really easy for people. I don't know. <laughs> Um, my business card is on your seat. I have so many emails from InvestorCon because I've already pre-purchased, so they're asking like, do you know a friend, do you know whatever. If you can't scan this, email me and I will um, forward you my plethora of emails about the conference and the hotel and... It, it comes up, it goes straight to um, the registration. Perfect. Yay! Yay! Yes. All right, without further ado, oh, sorry, yeah. Without further ado, here I am. <laughs> so I'm really excited to be here to present to you guys. You guys are probably one of the first to know about it, but I've created a brand in midterm rental hospitality called Hestia. And everyone's like, how do you pronounce that? What's Hestia? Well, Hestia is the Greek goddess of hearth, home, and hospitality. And I've always, as a young child, I always loved, you know, like Aphrodite and Minerva and all those Greek goddesses. And I just thought the Hestia name was so unique and so different, and how can I make it more of a branding 
thing to just, it stands out. So I want to kind of share with you why I'm doing this and you're the first to hear it. So, so the problem statement, this is Apple presentation style. <laughs> the problem statement is we have a oversaturated market of short-term rentals here in Austin. Last year they had 8,000 listings. This year they have 18,337 listings. So if you own a short-term rental and you're wondering why your prices keep coming down, your occupancy keeps coming down, that's why. Now, if you look at it from a data perspective, 90.3% of those short-term rentals are running as short-term rentals. You hit the time threshold of 30 days right here. These are the number of listings. There's less than 2,000 um, midterm rentals that are 30 days and more okay, in Austin. We have also the top hosts that are running listings here in Austin. We have Vacasa, mm -hmm. totally STR only. Yeah. We have Wanderjot, also STR only. We have Hill Country Premier Lodging, also STR only. We have Evolve that does all, almost all STR. And then Hello Landing, you guys might have heard of that. They do midterm rentals, but they're in apartment buildings. Mm -hmm. I think they're in arbitrage program, possibly. Mm -hmm. So again, Oversaturated market, too many illegal, illegal listings, and then the top posts are also STR focused. So who's paying attention to midterm? There are some people, I'm not gonna argue with that, but they're not me. <laughs> no, okay. But they're just, um, they're more national focused, and I wanted to really focus on Austin specifically. So problem statement number two is that the short-term rental market has holes in the calendar. So if you ever have someone that has an insurance claim, right? and they need to suddenly move out of their home. They wanna find somewhere where they can stay for a longer period of time. Well, when you look at your standard uh, calendar, you're gonna have weeks open and then weeks closed, yeah. and then it's just hard to stay somewhere. And it's just, you know, if you're gonna stay somewhere, you wanna be able to just stay there rather than pick up everything and, and go to the next place and pick up everything and go to another place. So um, there's not a midterm dedicated site for Austin, and hotels are also very expensive as well as short-term rentals, because many short-term rentals are not priced for longer stays. Mm -hmm. The potential clientele that I can see are all these different companies that are coming in, right? We all recognize these names. But in addition, we have people that are remodeling, insurance claims, digital nomads, people that are building a home, and snowbirds, right? And like the list goes on. Like if you just think outside the box, you can continue finding midterm rental uh, candidates. Oh, the one big one that I missed here is traveling medical professionals. Yeah. I kind of left that one off though because their price point is a little bit different than what I offer. Yeah. So the opportunity, I like to say, and it's not something that I coined, but the riches are in the niches. Okay. So I started a website called CorporateRentalsAustin.com. There's nothing more SEO friendly than that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, so I thought like, well, I could do a website, a marketing platform, but maybe I could also do a brand. There's gonna be your regular midterm rentals, but maybe there's those, those properties that are a little bit extra. So the Hestia properties are extra. So here's how it looks, right? So when you look at a brand position standpoint, you have Furnish Finder, right? People are paying $99 a year to Furnish Finder only to realize that no one wants to pay more than 12 to $1,400 a month to stay there. But if you run like a two bedroom or three bedroom home like I do, you need a little bit more than that to even sustain the property. So then you have um, your Airbnbs, water job, they cost involved, they're on the high price short-term rental scale. At a bigger pockets conference, I trust their data, they said that 25% of bookings on Airbnb are 30 day rentals. That's a big, that's a big chunk. Yeah. But if you think about how much people are paying on, um, they're paying, between 14 and 16%, the client is paying that much on top of the booking fee in order to make that booking. So what if we could redirect those clients subtly into another platform where they don't have to pay that booking fee, right? I think that brings up an opportunity there. So we have Hello Landing, and then this is where Hestia lands, right? We're a midterm rental at a medium price. I'm not aiming for a higher price. I'm not, I'm not calling it luxury. I'm just calling it good quality. So it's like you can choose either a extended, what is it called, a extended stay hotel, right? <laughs> Gross, right? Not for me, sorry, but maybe like a JW Marriott. Not a Ritz Carlton, but maybe a JW Marriott, something nice. So that's the Hestia brand. So 
the goal is to have a brand strategy, differentiate ourselves from all the other midterm rentals that are out there. When we have happy guests, we can get referral businesses. This next one is really important, is desaturation. When you, um, when people are choosing to market their property on my platform, there's not gonna be competition because at the same time, I don't want you coming on my platform and taking away my bookings. If you have a two bedroom and two, two bath in 78759, sorry, there's no spot for you. Maybe if you have a three bedroom, two bath, yes, we can talk about it because you're now not competing with me. I wanna make sure I limit the number of people that are on this platform so that we're, um, it's not just a free for all, right? And then finally, this is a relationship business. I believe so much in relationships because that's what has kept my midterm rental successful, right? I have six of my own and two that I manage for a friend and we've had basically continuous coverage the entire time. I would say we had little gaps here and there, but occupancy about 95%. And this is, you know, by building these relationships, it's been good for three years. So why don't I scale it out to other people that want to work with me? Um, so stay tuned for more. Um, I actually got off a call with Furnish Finders on Wednesday and they've invited me to be on their podcast. Mm -hmm. It's a recording next week. So there's things that I'm doing that I'm constantly doing to develop this business and this brand. So um, this one I just talked, I didn't talk about the midterm rentals yet, but I did talk about short-term rentals and but not the brand. I talked a little bit about flipping here, but here's where I really talk about um, the short-term rental versus midterm rental strategy. And then that one's more about flipping, but I do talk about midterm rentals as well. So uh, I'm really you know, driving that demand to the website, working with insurance companies. I have, um, I had a great call with one of the biggest global relocation companies in the world a couple weeks ago, and they love what we're doing with the brand. Um, <clears throat> and they said they'll give our properties a few tries, and then if they like it, we'll enter their supply chain, right? So I think that's really promising. And as well as you know, insurance companies. So that's it. I hope you guys like what you see. All right. Um, without further ado, I'm really <laughs> pleased and excited to share with your speakers tonight. Her name is Susan Geis. She is going to be presenting on um, growing up in rural Apple. Appalachia. 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 I'm sorry, Appalachia. I'm this for you. Grew, she grew up in rural Appalachia, and she's going to teach us how she came from poverty, almost, right? Yeah, in the mountains of East Tennessee. In the mountains Tennessee. of East Tennessee, yeah. and now she lives a financially <laughs> free life with her husband. So, welcome. All right. Thank you, Vivian. Awesome. So look forward to seeing what's going to happen with Hestia. It's very exciting. All right. So yes, I'm Susan Geist, um, and girls just want to have fun. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my agenda for this presentation, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my backstory, um, my real estate investing journey, um, how I achieved financial freedom. And then I'm gonna blow your mind by telling you how I reduced my federal tax bill from $137,000 to $6,500 while increasing my income using real estate. And then I'll share some resources at the end. My disclaimer, I love investing in tax data, but I am not a certified financial professional. <laughs> this is about my situation, so don't take all of this as personal investment advice. Do your own due diligence. All right, so a little bit about the FIRE movement. So this is, uh, it stands for Financial Independence Retire Early. I feel like the retirement is kind of a misnomer here. A lot of people think of retirement as being old and then you just kind of sit around mm -hmm. and watch TV. But really it's about being able to not have to sell your time for money anymore, yeah. being able to do what you want. Um, and you kind of have to adopt this mindset of prioritizing what's most important to you. Um, and so that'll help you with like your current spending, what you should be spending money on, what you shouldn't, and then also your future goals um, when you're looking forward. So when you're saying, okay, well, I'm not going to buy this fancy car so I can whatever in the future, right? So just kind of keep your mind around that. Um, and you can really put your money to work through investments. You always want your money to be working for you in some way. Um, and really, 
This is moving from the professional wage er earning class to the asset owning uh, gentry class. So here in the US, you know, you're told you need to go to college, take out a ton of loans, and then go and work for someone until you're 65 or 70, you know, pay your dues. Um, but there's this whole other class of people, right, that own assets. These are, you know, they have the real estate um, and they're making money without having to sell their time to somebody. Um, and even, you know, when you watch like a romantic movie or whatever, they're always like, oh, go find the partner that's a doctor or a lawyer. They're not like, go find the guy that owns 15 Jiffy Lubes. <laughs> that's what you need. <laughs> That's where the real wealth is. I mean, if your doctor dies, or if you're a doctor and you die, um, you're not making any more money. Those 15 Jiffy Lubes are still there. So, <laughs> it's not as respected here in the US, but you know, it's often much more lucrative to be up in that gentry class. Um, so it's kind of something to think about, what would you do if you had full control over your time? All right, so my roots. This is the lovely, very contaminated town of Oak Ridge, Tennessee, in the mountains of East Tennessee. Um, it's known for refining uranium during World War II. The whole town is radioactive. Um, a lot of people end up with rare cancers and beryllium poisoning. Um, so my dad worked at the National Laboratory there, and uh, it's kind of a strange place to grow up. It's very unique. Um, all the houses, because it was built so quickly, it's like the secret city. Um, all the houses are um, A's, B's, C's, D's, and then the multifamilies are E's. So they're all these five models of houses all through the city that were built in the early 40s um, super quickly. So it is, it's kind of a strange looking town. Um, so this is my why. So that's my mom and me. Um, so my mom was in an abusive relationship with my dad. He was um, extremely emotionally abusive to her and she had no way out because she didn't have finances of her own. She was a stay-at-home mom. She had gone straight from college to, you know, getting married, having me and my brother, and um, so she was kind of stuck. And she ended up passing away and um, it was a very sad situation. And so I made the decision that I never wanted to be beholden to a bad person or a bad situation because of finances. And I never wanted to see other women having to be beholden to anything bad because of finances. Um, and then I also feel like, like Megan alluded to, that you know, the more wealth women have, the more control we have over politics and regulations and you know, no matter your opinion on it, I feel like women should at least be making the decisions about our bodies and we should be able to decide do we want our kids shot at school you know and i feel like if we were controlling more of the money we'd have more of a say I, if the ceo of amazon was a woman and she came up and said we're not going to operate in any state where women don't have rights i don't think this would be an issue mm -hmm. and so i want to see women move up right now Women, you know, we're 50% of the population. We only control 30% of the assets. So we have a long way to go. And I'm so happy you guys are here and <laughs> also passionate about that too. All right, so my backgrounds, um, I have an undergraduate degree in math. Um, I have a master's degree in environmental toxicology. I graduated with tens of thousands of dollars in student loans, like most people. Um, and landed a job in Washington, D.C., a very lucrative federal government job making $42,000 a year. And I spent many hours right before that job crying in banks and credit unions because no one would give me a car loan. And I needed a car to get to D.C. for my first job. And so, you know, that was kind of my first uh, introduction into the real world and crap, you know, I've, I've got to get my finances together and figure out how I'm not going to be dependent on other people. Um, so I did this kind of weird house hacking strategy. So most people will talk about house hacking um, where you're like running out of room in your house to get your lodging paid for. I kind of did the other way around. So my first two years at work, um, I was actually in a training program that had me doing details all over the country. So I was out of DC a lot of the year. And the assumption was that I would keep an apartment in DC 
And then whenever they sent me out on detail, they paid for my housing and my per diem. So I got food and all mm -hmm. that covered. So I did not keep an apartment in DC. When I was there, I just found like rooms on Craigslist. I had an air bed, I would blow up the air bed, I would bring my cat in, <laughs> and that was all my furniture. And then when, it, when they sent me out on a detail, I'd pack up my air bed, be deflated, and <laughs> go off on my way. And so that allowed me to save like half of my salary for each of those years. Wow. And so I was able to accumulate um, quite a nest egg that way. And then uh, my last detail was actually here in Austin in 2007, and that's how I ended up here in Austin. All right. So my real estate journey. Um, so by 2008, I had actually saved up enough money to put a down payment on a home here in Austin. Things were not nearly as expensive <laughs> as they are now. And the market had crashed, and I got the first time home buyer credit. So things were aligning perfectly for me, and I got this beautiful 886 square foot, 1936 fixer upper home. <laughs> um, but it was mine, I was excited. Um, I actually married my husband the next year, Brian, um, and we rented out that house and took a year off and went uh, backpacking around the world. This is a, it's a paranoiding in the Philippines. Cool. And then, so we had our first son in 2011 and I bought my first duplex in 78704 um, in 2012. And it was a 3-2 on each side. And then I got this crazy idea that we should move to Raleigh to be closer to some of my relatives and it was terrible. <laughs> we came back to Austin. Um, and so we sold this house and we moved to Raleigh and made money off of it. And then we sold our Raleigh house, made money off of it. Um, so we came back, we bought a 1958 fixer upper and actually lived in our duplex for a while um, while we were working on that. And then in 2018, we purchased um, two duplexes in Elgin. And in 2020, right before COVID, we did a 1031 exchange. So that's where um, you sell a property and you buy another property and you defer the taxes. Um, and we actually did a one for two. So we sold that original duplex that we had bought um, and we bought a fourplex in Bertram and we also bought a short-term rental um, beach condo, a fixer-upper on Padre Island. Mm -hmm. And you know, if I had known that real estate prices were gonna shoot up like 25%, I would not have done this. <laughs> um, but at the time, it made a lot of financial sense, and it still hasn't, hasn't been a bad decision. Um, so we're cash flowing the same amount that we were on the duplex on the fourplex, and we essentially got the beach condo for free. We paid cash for it out of what was left over. Um, so we fixed it up, this is the before and the after, um, and it was a great place to vacation during COVID when we couldn't go anywhere else. Um, so since that fixer upper went so well, I thought it would be fun to get a single family <laughs> house to fix up and rent um, in 2021. That's a picture of it there, 278745. And of course we got hit, like I'm sure a lot of you did, with the supply chain shortages, the labor shortages, it, and it just dragged out for over a year. Um, during that time, we also refinanced our primary home. This is what it looked like after we fixed it up. It still has its 1950s charm. Mm -hmm. um, but we pulled out $400,000 at a 2.5% interest rate. And we were able to take that money and invest passively in real estate syndications. So we're invested in uh, self-storage, mobile home parks, apartments, a hotel, and car washes, and we're averaging about 6% return. So we've got a really nice spread there on that money. Um, so we were getting close to finishing our renovation. There you can see uh, the inside of it. And the neighbor started harassing us about a tree in the backyard threatening to sue us. He took these like metal bars and tried to knock our fence down. And so we decided just to sell <laughs> when we finished that. So it was an unintentional flip for us, but we held it for over a year. Um, and that's actually important. And I'll tell you why when we get to the tax section, because we're doing something interesting with that. 
Um, so we used the profits from that flip. We made about 70,000. We sold right before the market went down. We were super, super lucky. Yeah. Um, we used the profits to buy a short-term rental cabin in East Tennessee in the Smokies mm -hmm. to take advantage of the short-term rental tax loophole, which I'll also talk about a little bit later. Loophole is kind of a misnomer. Um, it's just the way it's classified, but that's what it's called if you're searching for it online. <laughs> All right, so currently we are technically financially independent. We have 11 properties and many uh, limited partnerships in commercial real estate assets. We got a seven figure nest egg, six figure annual passive income. Hopefully we'll be leaving our W2 jobs sometime around the end of the year. Um, there's us in Egypt since over spring break last year. So like Megan said, you know, I made a lot of imperfect decisions along the way, but you just got to get in the game. You know, you just keep going and um, just keep moving forward and stay diversified and, you know, you'll come out typically okay on the other side. All right, so this is the chart they typically show for financial freedom. Um, and so this is just, if you were going to put money in an account, how much money you would need to have saved up to be able to retire to live off of. Um, so the rule of 25 and the 4% rule are essentially the same thing, just flipped around the other way. So you need to have 25 times your planned annual spending saved. You can withdraw 4% of your portfolio each year. So that comes out to needing $30,000 in savings for every $100 a month you're gonna spend. And so that's an interesting way to kind of think of your uh, spending. So what can you cut? What's really important to you? Is it worth $30,000 in savings to have that? Um, but the great thing about real estate is you can offset the total amount needed through other income, such as, you know, rentals. You can also do stock dividends, interest, little side hustles. And this was something that was, um, it kind of held me back at first because I was like, oh, I'm going to need to save, you know, millions of dollars or I'm going to need to find one particular thing that replaces all of my income. But what I've done is build it up piecemeal, you know, a couple hundred dollars here coming in, a couple hundred dollars there. And eventually you start building it up and it replaces your income. And I'll show you my table a little bit later on. All right, some ways you can generate this passive income. Um, interest on savings and bonds. And I wouldn't have even had this on here last year. But <laughs> right, it's so high now. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the rates are going up. I'm getting 3% on my uh, savings account now, which is crazy. <coughs> um, stock dividends, of course, real estate rentals, uh, real estate investment trusts, they just tend to pay good dividends. Um, real estate syndications, you can also rent your home less than 14 days per year without having to report the income to the IRS. That's the tax refile. Hmm? That's the Odessa. Oh, I don't know about that one. Yeah, that's that's the Odessa. Odessa. It's called yeah. Odessa. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, did not, I never knew that it was called that. But yes, and it's great here in Austin because you can rent your home out for like ACL um, or South by Southwest and make a ton of money and you don't have to report it to the IRS. Um, online courses, ebooks, um, for maybe younger folks, sponsored social media posts, <laughs> <laughs> affiliate marketing, you can rent your car on Turo. I actually know people doing that. Um, and then royalties and other passive business interests. So my mother-in-law gets uh, fracking, oil fracking royalties every month. Yeah, uh, she lives in Louisiana and they, I guess, did some drilling on her land, so she still gets a ton of money every month. Who is your 3% savings with? Uh, Capital One performance mm -hmm. savings, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is my chart. This is how I generate my passive income every month. So um, I've got my savings, I've got dividends from stocks, I've also got dividends from municipal bonds. So municipal bonds are great because you usually don't have to pay federal taxes on them. So that's a really good place to put your money. Mine earn five and a half to six percent. Um, so they're pretty good. Um, and then my two Elgin duplexes, my fourplex, um, and this is my net. So this is after I paid the mortgages on all of these properties. Um, my beach condo, my cabin, I'm still getting, I just bought the cabin in July, so I'm still getting it up and running, but I am at least making a little bit of money so far. <laughs> 
Um, and then these are all my passive investments here. So Wellings Fund, that's um, uh, self-storage, mobile home parks, light industrial, uh, good egg as apartments. And then I've got two apartment complexes I'm invest in, invested in in Houston, a hotel in Reno, which I'm afraid I'm gonna lose my money on. Um, I actually use that as an example in one of my courses for like red flags to look for when <laughs> you're doing a passive investment because I invested in it before I knew what I was doing mm -hmm. and I'm not sure how it's going to turn out. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm making a little bit on it right now. Uh, I'm investing in a car wash fund. Those are actually doing really well. And a real estate debt fund, which is a little different than these other ones. So there's no upside with that one. So a lot of these, you know, they'll sell them at the end and you can participate in the profit. So the real estate debt fund is a, really just a debt fund. So they loan money out to house flippers and I make 6% on what I have invested in there. I can pull the money in and out at any time. Um, so it's not locked in. Like a lot of these other ones are usually locked in for five to 10 years. Um, so that's actually been a really good opportunity for you know sort of transitional money when you're in between deals. Mm -hmm. um, just throw it in there. Can I ask how, well, your limited partner on these bought and deals dwellings, good egg on the order of like 50K, 100K to get these monthly distributions? Um, most of them are 100K. Okay, thank yeah. you. But the debt fund, the minimum is only 25,000 to get into that, which is nice. Mm -hmm. um, so you can have your balance as low as 25,000. What's the name of the RE debt fund? Um, so it's through passiveinvesting.com. It's a group out of Columbia, South Carolina. I really like them. I also, um, the car wash fund is through them. And they've been really good to work with. All right. Now we're gonna talk about taxes, everyone's favorite subject. <laughs> <laughs> but really, tax optimization is one of the most essential tools for growing your wealth. Um, you can get way more benefit from saving $5,000 a year on your taxes than you can from raising the rent at one of your properties by $100 a month. I had to learn this the hard way by paying some really big tax bills. Um, but I'm gonna go over two important concepts that you need to know as a real estate investor related to taxes the three tax buckets and depreciation. All right, so the three tax buckets. So this is how the IRS um, separates your income and losses on your taxes. So we've got active, portfolio, and passive. So in this active bucket, we've got your W-2 income, we've got active business income. So this is like, you have an LLC, it's bringing in money. Um, sole proprietorship. If you're doing Roth conversions, that's going to go in this bucket. Uh, if you're doing a short-term rental that is self-managed, it's going to go in this bucket. And this is this is the short-term rental loophole because the IRS considers it a business if you are managing it yourself, and this can save you a lot of money on your taxes. Mm -hmm. um, active flips. So if the IRS considers you a flipper. Um, your flipped properties are actually considered business inventory rather than capital gains. So they're going to appear here in the active um, category. So if you flip full time, if you flip multiple times a year, if you're doing short term flips, typically the IRS will consider you a flipper. If you just do like one every now and then, you can get away with putting it in another bucket. And then if you have real estate professional status, um, your activities will go in this active bucket. So that's, you can't have a W-2 job and claim that status. You have to have 750 hours or more in your real estate activities. You have to be managing all of your rental properties yourself. Um, so it's actually kind of challenging to justify that on your taxes. All right, portfolio income. So that's gonna be your stock and bond sales, your dividends, interest coming in, and your sales of non-business assets. So you sell your house and you're over the $500,000 tax-free gain that's going to go in this bucket. Um, if you sell like a classic car and you make a bunch of money, that'll go here. Um, any kind of property that you have that was never actually used as a business, that's going to go in this bucket. All right, and your passive income. So this is typically where your real estate's going to go, um, especially if you have a W-2 job. So rental real estate, uh, your real estate syndication income, any royalties that you get, any passive income that's reported to you on a K-1 form, 
um, at the end of the year. And then short-term rentals if you have a management company. So what happened to us in 2021, we had a bunch of income in this category and some income in this category and a whole bunch of losses in this category and we were not able to combine any of them. And we got a massive tax bill that we were not expecting. Um, so I got smart about how to move the categories and play a little shell game and significantly reduce my tax bill. And, but first we have to talk about depreciation <laughs> because it's a very important concept in real estate. It's one of the biggest advantages of owning real estate, being a real estate investor. Um, so depreciation allows you to recover the cost of a physical business investment on your tax return. So essentially it's a paper loss that you get to take on your tax return. Um, so the standard real estate depreciation is 27 and a half years if it's residential or 39 years non-residential for the building value. So you take the building value, you divide it by whichever of those numbers applies, you get to take that off of your taxes as a loss every year, even though it's not a real loss, right? It's just a paper loss, a depreciation paper loss. So you can also do this interesting thing where you complete a cost segregation. So you identify all property related costs that can be depreciated over five, seven, and 15 years. So you're essentially going through your property and identifying the things that wouldn't actually last 27 and a half or 39 years, like your appliances, the flooring, sometimes even the roof, things like that. And you group those into those categories. So in 2018, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act passed this regulation that said, you can take 100% bonus depreciation until 2022 on your taxes. So that allows you to add up all of this stuff in the five, seven, and 15 years categories and deduct it in the first year of owning your property. So we did this on our cabin this year and got about 160,000 that we're gonna be able to deduct from our active bucket, which is our W-2 income. Wow. So it just takes it straight off of there. Um, Unfortunately, starting in 2023, <laughs> the bonus depreciation is gonna decline 20% each year. So next year, you can only take 80% of the depreciation up front, um, which is still good. I think you know it's, it's still definitely beneficial to do that. Um, something you do have to think about that a lot of people don't mention is the depreciation recapture tax, tax rate, which is typically 25%. So it's higher than capital gains. So if you're not going to hold a property very long, um, you probably don't want to take the bonus depreciation. Um, so you really have to think about, okay, what am I going to do with this money that I have now? How can I deploy it to make more than I'm going to have to pay with that higher tax rate on the back end? So a little bit of math, but we can do math because a penis is not required to do math. <laughs> um, so yeah, just we have to think about the time value of money there because of course, you know, $50,000 now is worth more than 50,000 10 years from now. But the big uh, takeaway from this is it, it's creating big paper losses on your tax returns. This is how people like Donald Trump pay no taxes. All right. My 2021 federal tax bill is $137,000 on 550,000 in income, and I just about had a heart attack <laughs> to my taxes. Um, and they sent me, actually just this week, another bill for interest penalties, quarterly interest penalties. Mm -hmm. I paid what I was supposed to pay, but then they said, well, we should have had that money a little bit earlier. Oh. So, yes, that hit with another 800 bucks that I had to send them. My 2022 federal tax bill, I'm expecting it to be around $6,500 on 580,000 in income, so 1.1%. I'll show you how I'm gonna do that. All right, so here's my active bucket, and I've rounded some of these numbers and simplified it a little bit just to show the concepts. Um, so we'll say me, 100,000 W-2, my husband, 200,000 W-2. So that's our positive we've got sitting in the active bucket. So what are we taking off of that? We're gonna take off 20,500 each for our 401k contributions, because that is pre-tax. 7,750 for an HSA contribution, also pre-tax. 
$5,000 for dependent care FSA contributions, pre-tax. Here's my cabin, bonus depreciation here, $163,013 I get to take off. $3,000 for tax loss harvesting, which I'll talk about more in the portfolio income, and then our standard deduction of $25,900. So we're left with $54,337 in that category. That's pretty amazing. That's great, yeah. <laughs> All right, portfolio income. So as I mentioned, we had this failed flip that we did. Uh, it's unintentional. Um, so that actually, ends up in this category because it was never used as a rental. We're not flippers, we both have W-2 jobs. Um, we intended on renting the property out and that's typically what you have to show to the IRS, that you had an intention to rent it out, something happened and you didn't. Um, so it's gonna go here in our portfolio income. So we've got 70,000 long-term capital gain here. So we've got about $9,000 in dividend income and then we've got about 1,200 in our tax-free municipal bond income. So we're going to pay taxes on that. So, I, ha I happened to luck out that the stock market has gone down so much this year. This is a benefit of also having a stock portfolio in addition to your real estate. Um, so I went into my stock portfolio and did some tax loss harvesting. And you've probably heard about this before. A lot of people do it right at the end of the year because um, you can offset your capital gains by doing this. It's a paper loss you take on your stock. So I sold stocks at a $70,000 loss, actually did 73,000, um, and bought right back into the market. So I had the same amount of exposure, same dollar amount of exposure. You can't buy exactly the same thing, but I just I bought, I actually bought VTI, which is the Vanguard Total Index Fund. Yeah. Um, I sold individual stocks that I had, bought VTI. So I had the same amount of exposure, but now I have a $73,000 paper loss on my tax return. Mm -hmm that I can use to offset the gain from that unintentional flip that I sold. So you can carry over 3,000 to your active tax bucket. That's the, that's the max that you're allowed to carry over is 3,000. So anything else, you gotta keep it in your portfolio bucket to use against your capital gains. Susan, can I ask you a question about that? Yes. So you said you sold individual stocks and then bought an index fund. But if I like sold one index fund, I couldn't then buy into a different index fund, is that right? So it depends on whether it tracks the same index. If it tracks a different index, then it's fine. And a lot of them are a little bit different. So if you buy, if you sell like a Vanguard and you buy like an iShares, a lot of times they're actually tracking something a little bit different okay. and it's fine. Yeah, because you can't like sell VTI and buy VTI yeah. like that. Yeah, but I didn't know if I could like sell VTI and then buy a different Vanguard total money market fund that you know, yeah. is slightly more balanced than international. You could buy like VU, like S&P 500 instead of VTI. Okay, things that are pretty that? close. Mm -hmm. Wow, okay. Yeah, as long as it's not tracking exactly the same index, they've said it's fine. Okay. Yeah. Question. Yeah. So does it have to, as long as it's happened within the same calendar year, it's right. okay? Does it mm -hmm. have to be like back to back transaction? Right. Yeah. But it's nice to do it as a back-to-back -back so you get the same amount of exposure just in case the stock market like drops a whole lot, oh, right. or yeah, yeah, increases yeah. a whole lot. <laughs> All right, in our passive income bucket, so we had 160,000 in rental income, about 40,000 in syndication income, and then we were able to write all that off um, with depreciation. We have a bunch of bonus depreciation coming <coughs> in for these syndications that pass that along to the investors. Um, expenses, we had 125,000 carryover losses from 2021 that we couldn't tap into because we had stuff in the wrong buckets. Um, and then also this strange thing, we inherited a work truck <laughs> um, from my father-in-law who passed away from COVID. And so you can actually depreciate a work vehicle 100% in the first year, as long as you use it for five years for business purposes. So we put it in this category. Our uh, tax strategist actually said, you know, the best place to put it would be here and say we're using it on the short-term rental. So we can subtract it from the active, but our short-term rental is in Tennessee. So yeah. I was like, oh, oh yeah. yeah. Great. yeah. <laughs> um, they're probably going to know we're, we're not using this truck in Tennessee. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put it in our passive bucket. 
All right, so yes, we ended up with 54,000, 9,000, and zero in our three buckets. I have a question. Can yes. Can go back to the slide? Yes. Okay, so you made a $70,000 loss on your stock portfolio. Yes. And you're deducting the 3,000 of it on your active income as well? So 73,000. You made 73,000. So I took a $73,000 paper loss on my stock portfolio. And yeah. you get 70 in your portfolio and three in your active. Right, because you can only put 3,000 in your active. Oh. That's the max. It can't be usually until that 70 is gone, right? Yeah, yeah, so you can, you can carry over losses in these categories. Mm -hmm. You just can't usually combine them. Sometimes you can combine portfolio and passive um, when you sell rental property, that'll be on Schedule D with your portfolio capital gains and losses. So you can do tax loss harvesting typically also against sales of rental properties um, since they're both on your Schedule D. So if you think about, I don't know how familiar you guys are with the schedules, mm -hmm. um, but Schedule C would be up here. Um, Schedule B and D is going to be here. Mm -hmm. So that's like your interest, um, dividends, capital gains. Um, and then Schedule E is in your passive bucket. All right, so here's what we ended up with. So <laughs> our active bucket, $54,337, which puts us in the 12% tax bracket. Yay! <laughs> so our tax bill is around 6,500. So it's a 10% tax bracket, you know, it's incremental, right? For the first like $12,000 and then the rest is taxed at 12%, so about 6,500. Um, we've got this dividend income in our portfolio bucket. So the tax rate on dividends is 0% if you uh, are filing married filing jointly and you make less than $80,800. So got a $0 tax bill there and then we zeroed out our passive. So our total gross income was $580,000. Total net income $63,337. Total tax bill is $6,500, 1.1%. Awesome. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. I have a question. So how did you figure this out? Like, did you talk to your person? Do you just study this and figure this out, or is your tax person brilliant and goes, okay, this is what we need to do? <laughs> so I do my own taxes. Um, I do talk to a tax strategist um, when I have questions. <laughs> So you can pay, it's actually two different services, like having a CPA do your taxes yeah. and having consulting uh, with a CPA or a tax office is something different that you can pay for. So you do your taxes? I do my own taxes. Um, and I knew we had a big problem in, in 2021. <laughs> so I was like, we've got to fix this. Um, we're paying this incredible tax rate, huge tax bill. Um, we're severely impacting our wealth growth, yeah, you know, yeah. moving forward. And Trump kept saying only stupid people pay taxes. So mm -hmm. I was like, okay, well, I already saw them. But yeah, um, and it is frustrating because a lot of CPAs don't understand how these real estate deductions work. Mm -hmm. Most CPAs specialize in small businesses they do small business accounting. They're focusing mo mainly in this active category. Um, they'll do, sometimes they'll recommend tax loss harvesting if it's not too late. If they're doing your, if they're looking at your taxes before the end of the calendar year, which usually they're not. Um, but if they are, they may recommend tax loss harvesting if you have capital gains. Um, but yeah, even real estate specific CPAs, a lot of them don't understand how this stuff works. So, I mean, my goal is that you guys would be able to start understanding some of it to be able to either do your own taxes or at least look at what you're getting from your CPA and say, okay, this doesn't look quite right, or maybe we can move this in a different bucket, um, and really start getting a handle on it yourselves rather than just relying on these people that a lot of times don't have all the education about it. Oh, yeah. How do you become educated about it? Are there resources that you would recommend? Um, yeah, so I'm in this really good, um, it's a, a tax strategy, real estate strategy group on Facebook. Um, I think it's called Tax Smart Real Estate. It's run by Hall CPA. 
Um, highly recommend that. Um, there's people just constantly asking these kinds of questions. I have you know this scenario of want to take this bonus depreciation. You know, I have a duplex, half of it's a short-term rental. Can I do that? The bonus depreciation questions like that, and so you can learn a lot that way. They're who I work work with um, with my strategy tax stuff too. Yeah. Can you repeat the name? I just tax. I think it's tax smart real estate investors. With Hall CPA. Yeah, there's a really good, um, there's a really good no low, like taxes 101 for real estate investors mm -hmm. or something. But that's like how I learned the very basics of these buckets. It's like taxes for dummies for real estate investors or something like that. But it's what it's that no low series. And yeah. Updated every year, which is great. And bigger pockets sells a couple of tax specific. Yes, books I've read those. As well, those are really good. Are really helpful. Yeah. I think those are by Amanda Hahn, yeah. the ones that Bigger Pockets publishes. And I have both of those. <laughs> All right, here's an even better strategy. This is how people often pay no taxes. So if you are in a couple and one of you has a W 2 job and the other one does not have a W 2 job, it is most beneficial for the non-W-2 person to get real estate professional status. Yeah. Oh. And that allows you to take everything that you saw over there in the passive bucket and move it to the active bucket. Mm. Yeah. So all of your partner's income will now be offset by all this depreciation that you're getting from your real estate, which is awesome. Um, you can also, Technically, once you have real estate professional status, do a grouping and group your syndications in and move that whole set over to active. Even though your syndications are passive, the IRS will allow you to do a grouping. And once you group them, you can't ungroup them. So you have to think about, is this what we're gonna continue doing for the future? If you plan on going back to work, it would be bad to group them. Um, but it can be extremely lucrative at that point because you tend to get a lot of bonus depreciation off of those syndications because they're buying like giant apartment buildings, you know, that have a hundred fridges and things like that. So um, this is an extremely powerful strategy. I know a lot of people don't pay any taxes because they do this. Quick question. And by that, do you mean being able to prove that you work seven months? Mm -hmm. Right, so Correct. getting the real estate professional status. Not, it, and it doesn't matter if you have other 1099 work, does it? Mm, it depends on whether you can prove to the IRS that you've put in 750 hours mm. and you're doing more real estate than anything else, yeah. substantially more real estate. Right. I'm more satisfied that requirement though. Yeah. You still need to show 51% of your income <coughs> to real estate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. and so to do the short term. Of the individual or the couple, if you're in a just the individual. Oh, the individual. Got it, got it. Yeah. Um, and so to get the short-term rental um, active status, you can have a W-2 job, um, but you do have to put in 100 hours on your short-term rental and substantially more than anybody else, which really isn't hard to do, especially if you're doing any kind of renovations on your short-term rental. Mm -hmm. if you're managing all like the Airbnb and Verbo and um, Price Labs, any kind of software you might be using. Um, I haven't had a problem. We bought it in. July, um, and I've already hit the 100 hours on ours. And I manage it from here, and it's in Tennessee, and it hasn't been a problem. Sorry, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat that? So by <laughs> doing 100 hours in a short-term rental, what does that do? So that will put it in the active category. In the active. Mm -hmm. As long as you don't have another manager working on it. So you don't that have like a ball or whatever. Um, if you're managing it yourself, you do 100 hours and substantially more than anybody else. Sure. So, like with our cleaners, so our our cleaning company has different people that come in and mm -hmm. rotate. Mm -hmm. So if you had like one cleaner that was coming every single time, the IRS might look at that, but ours has different people that come in, and so it's none of them are doing more than I do. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Different cleaners, yeah. <laughs> so by saying professional, you're just saying how many hours Right, so you don't have to be a realtor. <laughs> Professional is right. like proved by the hour. Right. Okay. And the IRS has been, they've kind of gone back and forth on whether some other professions apply to this, like being a plumber or an electrician. There's mm -hmm. kind of, there's mixed rulings on that. 
Um, yeah. So, you know, real estate can be a very powerful tax tool. All right, so this is my website. Um, so I started doing classes and coaching. I'm very passionate, as I said, about empowering women with their own finances, their own education. Um, I feel like this is, this is what we need to get our finances in order. We need to know what's going on with our investments and how to grow our generational wealth. These are two classes I have coming up um, in January and February. So I teach um, Sensational Investing Level 1. Um, it's for live weekly virtual sessions. Um, so this is sort of an intro to investing, so how to set up a diversified portfolio. Um, we'll look at determining your risk tolerance, optimizing your retirement contributions. So should you be in a 401k? Should you be doing a Roth? Should you be doing a backdoor Roth? Um, how to generate passive income and exploring basic real estate investing opportunities. These will be ones that have a lower barrier to entry, like real estate investment trusts, house hacking, things that you don't need to have like $100,000 to get started in. And then level two um, will run in February. So this is a much higher level uh, investment education. So we'll start looking at how to eva evaluate individual stocks um, implement a lot of these advanced tax strategies that I showed. Um, we'll look at criteria to evaluate passive real estate investing opportunities, like how to read uh, PPM. Um, and we'll also look at a little bit of infinite banking uh, opportunities. So this is when you borrow against your own assets without having to draw down the asset. So um, a common <coughs> example of that is uh, HELOC, home equity loan, uh, line of credit. Um, so you're borrowing against your house, but you don't have to sell your house to do that. Um, you can also do that on your stock portfolio. So that's a way that I actually um, pull a lot of cash. So I'll borrow against my stock so I don't have to sell my stock when the stock market is down, um, but I can borrow against it. I, was, I borrowed some at like six and a half percent recently because um, I needed some cash. Um, and then universal life insurance, which I personally am not a big fan of, but we can look at it. Um, everyone I know who's a big fan of it is also a broker. So <laughs> that should be something. Um, and then I also do like individual coaching and you can book that on my website if you just wanna chat for an hour about strategies, tax strategies, your personal situation. Um, I'm happy to do that. And what's your hour rate? Um, I think it's 165 that I have. So, yeah, there's my website. All right, I really love this quote. Um, someone with half your IQ <laughs> is making 10 times as you because they aren't smart enough to doubt themselves. <laughs> I think a lot of women get stuck in this. Um, but just keep this in mind, you know, we're all very capable and you guys are obviously very passionate about this, passionate about um, building your own wealth and building your family's wealth. Um, and so I believe you guys can do it. I think we all can do it. Um, we can get to that 50% or more of the world's wealth and start taking back some more power. <laughs> income. I'm hoping to do more of the classes and 
the coaching just because I'm very passionate about it. You know, I don't think I'm going to be making six figures a year off of it, but you know, it's going to be one piece of that passive income, right? Mm -hmm. Make a little bit here and there. And um, yeah, so that's probably what I'll do. Yes. I've been thinking a lot about the real estate <coughs> ecosystem and its opportunity um, and know very little about it so far. So if you had just like a couple of key little nuggets of wisdom <laughs> or like potential <laughs> pitfalls to avoid, what would you say? Um, I would say don't use these big online brokers like CrowdStreet. Okay. That has been a downfall. <laughs> um, Typically, you'll find deals on there that the syndicators, for some reason, their personal investors were not sold on, and so they brought it to CrowdStreet, um, and CrowdStreet is just kind of a marketplace, and so they're not going to make sure that the syndicator stays in touch with you, provides updates, like there's, yeah, there's just really no backing there from, the, from them, and so that, that hotel deal deal that I did that was a crowd street deal and mm. it's yeah um, and then another thing you want to look for right now um, in these deals is um, their loan terms so if they're doing a bridge loan and they're planning on a refinance and their returns are including that refinance a lot of times they'll do a bridge loan for like two years I think there's a good chance that the interest rates are still going to be really high in two years and you're probably not going to end up getting the return that they're promising. Um, a lot of those syndications are starting to run into that now. They started two or three years ago, they're getting to the end of their bridge loan, and now it's like, oh crap, we've got to refinance at, you know, nine or ten percent when we thought we were going to get like four or five percent. And so there go your returns down the toilet. So, <laughs> yeah. So Are definitely the alternative get, to a bridge loan? What's the alternative? To that? Um, they can refinance into like conventional, they could do another bridge loan, hard money loan. Um, sometimes they're planning on actually selling the asset at that point, mm. which probably isn't gonna work right now. <laughs> um, so a lot of them I think are starting to run into trouble. Um, so definitely look at how the financial plan is structured right now. I mean, it's the past few years, kind of anyone has been able to be a syndicator. Yeah. Right, and so a lot of people just jumped in and they were like, I'm amazing at this, you know. <laughs> My property went up 25% and now here they are, they're not doing the due diligence that they need to do and I think a lot of people are gonna start losing money. Um, I really like the groups that I work with. Wellings Capital is great. They're my favorite, probably. Um, they've been doing it a long time. They work with extremely vetted operators. Um, and they've only lost money one time, and they were very open about it, and it wasn't on the deal that I was in, but I think they've, they've learned a lot, and um, so that's just my favorite of all the ones. What was that name? Wellings. Well, it was on our list. Wellings Capital. Yeah, they're out of Virginia. Can they work with accredited investors? What? Sorry, I was just gonna see if they only work with accredited investors. Usually, um, sometimes they'll have a fund that's open for uh, sophisticated investors. Um, so typically you have to be accredited to invest in most syndications, but sometimes they will open them um, to sophisticated. So to be an accredited investor, you've got to have um, I think it's a million in assets and 200,000 coming in an income a year to be accredited. Because you're always. Yeah. Um, and then sophisticated, you just have to say you have the education to know what you're doing. So it's open to a lot more people. Yeah. Can I recommend a book for people interested in syndication? Yeah. It's called uh, The Hands Off Investor. I've heard of that um, one, yeah. It's, I think it's part of the bigger pocket yeah. thing, but uh, it's probably the best book on mm -hmm. syndications from the passive investor perspective. You mentioned that in the, um, the Bridge um, syndication um, Zoom calls that I host. That I, I yeah. need to write down because I, there was a really, really great. Um, it it you know, is. Mix. I had a couple people reach yeah. out to me afterwards to ask me for the name of that book, and um, it's hands down the best one. There are a couple of others that are specifically oriented for the passive investors, mm -hmm. but like they're too. Mm, 
technical and that one is really good and actually goes through like how you should be vetting sponsors, mm -hmm. how you should do it in your PPM and all of the details. Mm -hmm. Do you have the author on that? Do you mind sharing? Brian Soft Investor by Brian Burke. Thank you. Yeah. And you said you'll go over that in February in your class. Yeah. You didn't talk about how to vet. Yeah. Presentation. Which ones? Uh, <laughs> like uh, the cabin or the other rentals that you have? Yeah. Um, so I got them in different ways. Um, some of them were on the MLS, actually. Some of them I got off market. Um, and I actually, I will forever kick myself for this, had the opportunity to buy the whole set of those duplexes in Elgin. There were maybe 15 of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so one was on the MLS, and I talked to the owner and he's like, yeah, I need to offload these. But at the time I was like, eh, it's awful risky to buy all of my properties in one place mm -hmm. just in case something happens. And, now. and so I just bought two. So I got one on market, one off market. Um, but now, I mean, he was offering them at 165. Jeez. Wow. Oh, what are they now? What are they now? Yeah, what are they worth? Gosh, I don't know, probably 250, I would say. Oh, so nice. I don't know another question. Yeah, and then um, the short-term rental shop um, is a great place to partner with. Um, it's Avery Carl. She also has partnered with Bigger Pockets. Um, she has a book, uh, Short-Term Rental, Long-Term Wealth. So if you're interested in short-term rentals, it's a great book. Um, but they have a whole short-term shop consulting business. They've got a big Facebook group. Um, so you just take their intro class, which is free, and tell them where you want to buy a rental in one of their markets. They have realtors in all the top short-term rental markets in the U.S. Um, Smokies is one of their big markets. Mm -hmm. And they will pair you with a realtor and start sending you listings and help you get your property. They do training classes on how to manage it yourself, um, how to get everything set up, how to find a cleaner. Like, it's, it's really amazing. So SPR shop. Yes. And you said you were making 500 a month um, already on that smoky cabin, yet you don't have it on Airbnb yet. You're I still do. working on it. No, I do. So you're doing both. Um, so I am doing a little bit of work on it. I went earlier this month and spent three days there. Okay. <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Changing out faucets and door sure. knobs. And, sure. Um, but yes, we just, we put it in the rental pool right away. Because okay. I knew we wanted to use that bonus depreciation, so we had to get it in service. Got so it. I've got it on Airbnb and I've got it on Vervo. Uh -huh. and what did you pay for that, if you don't mind me asking? Unfortunately, that was right at the top of the market. Yeah. Um, I paid 486 for it. Oh, it's six and a half percent interest rate. Oh, man. So, yeah, I got a pretty hefty mortgage payment. But for us, I mean, you know, we're saving like $60,000 on our taxes right. with it. And so I'll be able to take that money, hopefully invest it somewhere else. And then that's more money I'm having, you know, coming in based on the cabin. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So I can add that to whatever I'm making. What were you investing in next? I don't know. Um, I think the market is definitely going down. <laughs> so I'm keeping an eye out to see. Um, I've been thinking about if we both quit our W-2 jobs, uh, getting another short-term rental next year, doing an 80% bonus depreciation, and doing a Roth conversion to mm -hmm. offset. So I could move, so if I took 100,000 bonus depreciation, I could take 100000 out of the 401k, move it to a Roth, owe no taxes. Mm. So oh. that's what I'm kind of toying with, whether I want to do that. <laughs> so Yeah, there's all sorts of interesting Clever. things yeah. you can do. It's a little game for you. It is. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I'm so mad at how much at money it. the government <laughs> has taken from me. <laughs> <laughs> it's also frustrating that they make it so difficult to figure all that stuff out. Yeah. Yeah. But the reality is they need the taxes. Right. I mean, true. In the, right. If everyone could do this, right. and no taxes were paid by anyone, yeah. and that's why it's so hard to figure it out. Right. Because they don't want to do it. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the tax code, like the first few pages are what you pay in taxes. All the rest of it is how to not pay taxes, right? It's all the loopholes and everything. So, yeah. I mean, it's set up for people who have the resources and time to figure out what they need to be doing to take advantage of everything. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for this. This is amazing. Can you do the bonus depreciation on like a 30 days plus 
-hmm. Yeah, so it has to be seven days or less. Um, and so even if you have like a duplex and one side is long-term rental, one side is short-term rental, they take the average. Mm -hmm. And so it's not gonna count. Um, if you live in one side and you do a short-term rental on the other side, it does count because one is your personal residence. So you don't have to average anything. Does it have to be zoned as a duplex though? Um, no. So if you're renting out part of your house, you might be able to do it. Very informative, I think. <laughs> Take a photo of her website. Oh, rising oh. Well. <laughs> You guys get that? Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Cards, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes, and the cards, of course. Thank you again so much, Susan. We really appreciate having you. Um, thank you, ladies, and our wonderful sponsor, Amanda. We appreciate you yeah. and your space. during the day on Zoom. Um, that is November 17th with Tracy Z and Nope Investing. So please join us there. Sign up for the meetup and um, come join and participate. We have lots more things coming and we're really excited to have you all here. Please um, tweet send to a friend that you know needs to be in this room. We know that we need more people in this room, so mm -hmm. tweet send them out. Um, there's also a sign up out at the front. If you didn't sign up, um, we would just love to be able to keep in contact with you. So thank you everyone for attending. Love having you here. Did I miss anything, Vivian? Um, next month we'll also be here, possibly as well as in January. Mm -hmm. I would love that. Um, and space. then we'll try to switch venues to another showroom. Sorry, Amanda. Oh. Um, <laughs> for, uh, I think it's going to be HTX Elite Construction, a uh, women-owned female, or women-owned construction company in Austin. So. They like this too. They have, yeah, they, have a, they have a brand new showroom that they've asked us to host in, so I'm um, really excited about that as well. So. Yay, that's great. Thank you, ladies. Thank, Thank you. you. And there's still food, so.